Hi, it's Sweet Deutsch here. Today I wanted to talk about, there's a question that I used to have, and I still don't have total clarity on this, but what am I looking at when I look at a halacha sefer? I think that that's a question that a lot of people either ignore or they consider it and they push it away, but it's very important to know. It's important to, to have clarity and know, I'm not just reading a book of laws. What, what are they? How do they how do they come to be? And if you look at the Kitzvah Shulchan Aruch, if you look at the Mishnah Bura, what are those laws? Some of them we know are directly written in the Torah, but even those, the details are not in the Torah. So where did they come from? So I wanted to review. It's re this is really a very extensive topic, and there are people who get into this more. I think Rabbi Miller talks about this in some of his books, and um, Barrel Wine. I know Rev. Breidowitz has some recordings available online that talk about this in greater detail. Historically, how, what was the development of the halacha? How do we have the laws that we read today? Where did they come from exactly? What was the process? What's the halachic process? So I'm, today I'm just going to give you a very, very, very concise overview just to give you an idea so that the next time you pick up a halacha sefer, you ask a rabbi, hey, what's the halach in this situation? What do I have to do? Understand what it is that he's addressing and where he's pulling this from. So, the first thing that we have, the beginning of everything, was the revelation at Harsina. We have the Torah that was given in front of three million people at Harsina. And along with that came what we call the Torah Shabbat Peh, which were explanations. If you read the Torah straightforward, it's very cryptic. It says, for example, you should wear tefillin. It doesn't say what tefillin are. It says that you should slaughter an animal uh, to make it kosher, but it doesn't explain how to do that. So along with the Torah was a commentary, and that commentary of the details of exactly what we need to be doing, what we call the halacha today, that was passed down from teacher to student, from father to son, throughout history. Now, what, what's, what's to be expected with that is that over time, people have differences of, of opinion and they kind of they forget what was originally intended. And we have a principle when it comes to understanding what the bottom line is from a Torah perspective. The principle is of Torah Lo Shemayimi. And uh, there's a famous story I think it was with Rabbi Lazar and the Chachamim, where Rabbi Lazar was disagreeing with the Chachamim over a particular halachic point, and he said, "I'm certain that I'm right about the halacha." If the halacha is like me, let heaven prove it. Let the tree over there, let it jump 100 meters. A miracle. The tree jumped. And the rabbi said, I'm sorry, but no, we don't agree with you. And he said, if the halacha is like me, let the river go backwards. And the river went backwards. He said, if the halacha is like me, let the walls of this medrash cave in. And they began to cave in. And he said, if the halacha is like me, let a heavenly voice come out and declare, it, and declare that to be the case. And a heavenly voice did declare that to be the case. And the Rabbanim said, the majority of the Chachamim said, Torah lo which means that the Torah was given over to us, the people. And when one, once somebody becomes an expert in understanding the tradition, and understanding the Torah and the oral law, it's up to us as, as individuals and as scholars and our rabbis to understand exactly what that is. And we're humans and we're fallible. And we're not necessarily going to know exactly what was originally intended, but our job is to make our best effort and to become scholars. And that best effort in understanding what was originally intended by Hashem, that's, con that, that's considered to be the halacha. So the halacha that we have is a result of either certain things that were never in dispute, and they're exactly as they were passed down originally. For example, the Torah itself, there aren't the 20 different versions of the Torah. There's just one. As opposed to, for example, the, the Christian Bible, the New Testament, there are many, many different versions with, with, with serious discrepancies between them. They're not all the same. So the Torah we have is intact. And many of the halachas that we have are also perfectly intact, as they were from the beginning. But there were detailed, there were, certain, there were differences of opinion about certain things, because that's what happens when it gets passed over from word of mouth. And when this began to, be, to get to be a, a bigger issue, Rabbi Yehuda Anasi, put together the Mishnayis. The Mishnayis is, is, is giving you the halachic bottom lines of 
What do we need to do in any particular situation? And that's what the Mishnah does. But the Mishnah was deliberately written in a very cryptic manner. And the reason for that is because the Torah Shabbat Pet was always intended to be in the hands of the people, to be passed down from student, from teacher to student, from father to son. And in order to maintain that, Rabbi Yudha Nasi did not want to put it down in, in all this detail. So he put it down, but in a very cryptic way, in a way that in order to really understand what it's saying, you still need a teacher. And that was the Mishnah. And as the generations went on, um, the the Amaram, and particularly Ravina and Ravashi, in the times of the Gemara and the second Mishnah they under, they understood that the, weak, the generations were getting weaker in their ability to remember everything and remember everything that, that, that all the all the Allahs. And they put down the Gemara. The Gemara examines the Mishnah and writes down, it goes into much greater detail what the Mishnah deliberately did not do to explain exactly what the halachas are and what we need to do in any particular situation that comes up. Now, the, the Gemara itself sometimes will give you directly the bottom line, but oftentimes it leaves it open and you need to be able to read it and an expert can read it and understand what the halacha is, because you can have multiple opinions in the Gemara who hold this is what was originally intended from by the Torah. And the other opinion that may hold this is what was originally intended. And the Gemara will give you both sides without necessarily telling you in a straightforward manner that this so-and-so is correct. And this is how we him. This is the halacha. Sometimes it does that, but often it doesn't. It leaves that to us. And that is what the Rishonim started to do. The Rishonim came afterwards, and most notably, the, the Rif, the Rambam, and the Torah who drew the halacha out of the Gemara. And they use, a, they use a, a logical approach to understanding this. And there are diff there's more than one way to reach the bottom line. One of them, if there's a difference of opinion, and this, this is a commonly used approach, is to count up. You have one guy has an opinion, and he defends his opinion. One of the uh, Amaram of the Gemara will defend his opinion using a number of proofs. And he'll ask questions on the other guy to discredit the other opinion. And the other opinion will do the same. And we can count up and see who has more proofs or less questions on them. And so that's, well, that's one of the ways of deciding what the halach is. It's not the only way, but that's just to give you an example of how it was done. Now, following that came the Shulchan Aruch. The Shulchan Aruch was Rabbi Yosef Karo, and he did what the Rambam, the Rif, and the Torah did not do, is he did it in a very, he, he put together a very concise halacha sefer that leaves out a lot of explanation and just tells you in a very straightforward manner and was intended to be a daily guide. And the way that he came, the way that he drew his opinions for the most part in terms of when he tells you, this is the halacha, this is it. What do you mean this is it? There's differences of, differences of opinion in the Gemara. There's differences of opinion among the Rishonim. So what he did was he looked at what he considered to be the three leading Rishonim. Um, I believe that was the... Rush of the, the Rif and the Rabba. I think those three, and he would take the majority opinion out of those three in order to give you the bottom line, so you know what you need to do from day to day. Now, at the same, at the, around the same time that the Shulchan Aruch was writing his concise halacha sefer, the Rama, who was uh, Ramosh Isilis, and he was an Ashkenazi rabbi, he was also writing one. And I heard from my Rebbe, very interesting. That he found he had spent years, the Ramah had spent years putting together his concise halacha sefer, and then he found out the Shulchan Aruch was doing the same thing. And instead of putting out a competing sefer, he reworked his material to be just a commentary on the Shulchan Aruch, which, which tells you a lot about his character. You know, he was a guy who who uh, he could have he, he put in a tremendous amount of work. He did exactly the Shulchan Aruch. He had a tr crazy, crazy amount of knowledge. He went through all of the Gemara, all of the Rishonim, the Achronim, hundreds of commentaries. And he drew the bottom line of the halacha out of, out of these, and he put it together in an organized fashion for someone to have a day-to-day -day guide on how to be a, hal a halacha Jew, how to live correctly. And he, he could have put it as his own say, for instance. He said, no, the Shulchan Aruch was already doing this. Um, I don't need to have the, the honor, so to speak, of having my own say for it. I'll just comment on his. I'll be a commentary on his. And that's what he did. So if you open up a Mishnah Bura, for example, on the top is the Shulchan Aruch in large text and in small text, wherever the Ramah disagrees with the Shulchan Aruch, 
he filled that he's filled filled in over there, and you can see the Ramah's opinion. And usually the Ashkenazim go with the Ramah, and the Sephardim go with uh, the Machaber, the Shulchan Aruch, from Yisroel Karo. And they're often they're oftentimes they agree with each other. They don't always disagree, but where they disagree, that's where the Ramah comes. So that was what the that's what the Ramah did. Now I think prior to the Ramah, the Kitzur Shulchan Aruch was written. I don't know who the author of that is, but I believe it was prior to the Ramah. And that is even more concise. That's just like, in a very, 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 very straightforward manner. And in a certain way, I don't like that. I mean, it's very, it's, as a daily guide, what do I need to do? You open it up, and you, might, you, look, you look up the right section under the right topic, and you find exactly what you need to do. And it's, it makes it very, very easy to use. For me, I like to understand a little bit more about the background. When I do something, when I look at the halacha, I want to understand, where does it come from? Which is why I, I open up the Mishnah Bura. Now, the Mishnah Bura is... Four sections in the Mishnah Baruch. This is the top, which has the Shulchan Aruch with the Ramaz commentary. And then we have the, have the Mishnah Baruch on the bottom. The Mishnah Baruch, who was the Chavetz Chaim, he came 350 years after the Ramah. So at that point, there were many, many commentaries on points, let's say, that the Ramah did not address specifically. The Halacha, let's say they tell you there's Halacha, um, the Halacha of exchanging a cow for a donkey, for example. Uh, well, how does that apply nowadays? Nowadays, I don't know too many people who exchange cows for donkeys. So we have to be able to draw the the principle, the bottom line out of that, and be able to apply it to modern day. And so there were many commentaries that were written on the Ramah, the Shulchan Aruch, and the Mishnah Brura, the Chavetz Chaim. He wrote his own. He wrote he wrote his own compilation of all those commentaries, so he can give us the modern day bottom line drawing on everyone before him that had, that had the 350 years between himself and the Ramah and the Shulchan Aruch. Now, when you look at the Mishnah, if you open up a Mishnah Bura, this is what I like to do. If I want to look at the Halacha about something, I like to open up the Mishnah Bura because it gives you a little bit more background and uh, Mishnah Bura will tell you that there are different, that it will bring in different opinions. Sometimes one of them is more strict, more lenient, so you can think, you know, you were brought, let's say you were brought up a certain way and someone tells you this is the halacha, this is the way things are. Well, if you look it up in the Mishnah Bura, you can see sometimes it's not so simple, and sometimes there's room to be lenient, sometimes it's even better to be stricter, and if you understand the underlying principle behind the halacha, you can go out and make your own decision and decide what's best for you within the framework of the halacha. And then, that's this is the, the inside, the closer to the inside of the page, that's the Mishnah Bura. On the outside, he has also written by the Mishnah Bura, is the Bera Halacha. In the Bera Halacha, he goes into greater detail into explaining the background and the sources for some of what he brings to the Mishnah Bura. And sometimes he'll bring in alternate opinions, where let's say he felt that the opinion should really be like one person, but there is a valid opinion, maybe a more lenient opinion, and he'll bring that in the Bera Lacha. So sometimes you can, I've, I've had found uh, more lenient opinions than in the Bera Lacha. And also, he gives you a lot of background information, logic, and where it comes from, where it comes from in the Gemara, where it comes from in the Rishonim. He does a lot of explaining about where the Halacha comes from. And then at the bottom of the Mishnah Bura, you have the Sharat Zion. The Sharat Zion is just a, um, I forgot what it's called. It's supposed to know English, but it's, it just tells you uh, where he got different opinions from. So when he tells you the Mishnah Bura, he says, in this situation, Allah is like this, and in this situation, it's like this. There's a little letter next to it, and you look at the Sharat Zion, and, and you can see where it, came, where it comes from. If he brings it from the Rambam, or he brings it from the Tor, from the... Uh, the Ketz of Mishnah, so he brings it from other people, and you can source it back. And like this, if you really want to, if you're interested in understanding the halacha in a particular situation and exactly how the halacha got to be the way it is, you can look at the you can look at the Mishnah Bura, and then you can go to the Sharat Zion, and you can trace it back. You can trace it back to the Rambam, and you can see where the Rambam got it from. You can trace it back to the Gemara, and uh, and eventually to to the halacha to the rabbinic uh, takana or the biblical commandment that it originally stemmed from. So that's a very nice thing to be able to do sometimes. So I hope that this wasn't too confusing, and I hope that, you're, that you were able to get a, a slight grasp. This is obviously a very, this is a much more complex topic, and you can look into this more if it's interesting to you. And if you have any comments, let me leave them, um, leave them below. I think there's a place for comments um, in terms of maybe I'll explain this a little bit better, or any, any uh, reference material that you feel that people can benefit from. And I, I hope this was helpful. Have a great day.